Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome back to this week's episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lessons, you are looking at the doctrine that is contained in sections 137 and 138. Now these two sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, they're not really revelations. In fact, they are visions. These are things that first the prophet Joseph Smith saw in reality in section 137, and then secondly, it's what Joseph F. Smith, the sixth president of the church, saw in vision as well. Now, these two visions took place 82 years apart from each other. So why have we put the two of them together in the Doctrine and Covenants? Quite out of chronological order. Perhaps, and it might be just my opinion, is because we're on the same theme. And we've coupled these two sections together so that when we look at section 137, and we'll find that Joseph sees his brother Alvin in the celestial kingdom, we then go to section 138 and find how it was possible that not only Alvin found his way to the celestial kingdom, but all of God's children have the opportunity to choose from themselves to be obedient to the laws and ordinances of the gospel and to find themselves also in the celestial kingdom. And so that's why I think that although out of chronological order comes the information of 137, I like that it's together with section 138 so that we can see the, the cause and effect of what Joseph F. Smith saw in vision and the end result and reality of, uh, of those things as taught by the prophet Joseph or as shown to the prophet Joseph much, much uh, uh, earlier, many years earlier. So we'll, we'll take a look at section 137 and then go into 138. Section 137, the scene for the historical context is pictured behind me. The picture behind me is of a small cemetery in Palmyra, New York. And the gravestone that you see is that of Alvin Smith, the older brother of Joseph Smith. Now, just to get your bearings, this little cemetery is at the top of a hill just around the corner from the Grand Inn print shop where the Book of Mormon was printed. It's about two miles or so to the north of the Smith family farm where the Smiths lived, farmed, uh, where Joseph was during those annual visits to the Hill Cumorah with the angel Moroni. It's there at the farm where the sacred grove is and where the first vision took place. A couple miles further down the road, two miles or so, is that the hill where the plates were deposited by Moroni and extracted by the prophet Joseph Smith. So that's, that's where we are, this, this, grave, this grave site or this cemetery. Alvin Smith was the oldest surviving child of father and mother Smith. They, first, they had a child, their first child, who only lived a few hours or so, uh, and then passed away. And then their second child, Alvin, he, but the first surviving child of the family, the oldest sibling. And when Joseph Smith came out of the sacred grove after having his first vision, why would people doubt what he had actually seen? In fact, in his history, he, he said, I had actually seen a vision. And though he, were, he was persecuted for saying such, he could not deny what he had seen. Yet, he did come out and people made fun of him. They teased him. They ridiculed him. They somewhat cut him out of society. had nothing to do with him. Now, this was devastating to the young 14-year-old Joseph Smith. And it was his older brother, Alvin, who would stick up for Joseph. He would stand by his side. Not only would he be a, a best friend and an older brother, he'd also be literally a defender of Joseph Smith. Now, this was handy for the prophet because Alvin Smith was well-liked by everybody. He was everybody's hero. All the guys wanted to be like Alvin, and all the girls in town wanted to date Alvin. He was that kind of guy that just everybody loved and was drawn to. And so when people started to ridicule and persecute Joseph for saying he had seen a vision, it was Alvin who would stand up and tell people to knock it off, and people would listen. Years would pass, about three years, Joseph would be kneeling at the bedside of, of, uh, in, his, in his room at the Smith family farm, and the angel Moroni would appear. Now, I, I'm recapping this because it's all pertinent to the information that I'm going to share with you that's sets the stage for what Joseph would see later, years later, as recorded in section 137. As he's kneeling by his bedside, the prophet 
On September 21st, 1823, the angel Moroni appears. The angel Moroni speaks to him all through the night. The next day speaks to him some more out in the field and commands Joseph to go to the hill. Joseph goes to the hill. He says, owing to the distinctness of the vision of the place where the plates were buried previously the night before, I knew exactly where the plates were. He says he gets a lever, probably a large stick. He puts it under the stone, moves it aside. He looks underneath the stone, and there's a a box, a stone box, holding the plates. He's not allowed to bring them home. So he goes home empty-handed. He gathers the family, father and mother Smith, all of the children, including Alvin, and he tells them of his, his experience with the angel Moroni the previous night and his experience at the hill that very day. Now, the Smith's children and parents knew all about the first vision, and now they were hearing more. They were hearing about Moroni and a record being deposited and how Joseph's name would be had for good and evil throughout the whole world, that the Lord had an important work for Joseph to do, that he was being called as a prophet, and yet he came home to tell that story empty-handed. He had no evidence, no proof. The plates were still in the hill. Again, all of this is very important to understanding section 137. At this point in the historical narrative, the parents and the siblings are all there listening to Joseph, who doesn't have any plates in his hand or any proof that any of this ever took place. And yet, as one of the greatest evidences of the truthfulness of Joseph's history, is the fact that neither his father nor his mother nor any of his siblings ever doubted Joseph's stories about what took place and what happened. Now think about it for a minute. Joseph's in the upstairs bedroom, kneeling and praying. His brothers had already fallen asleep in the beds there in that very room where Joseph is praying. And hence, in that very room where they're sleeping, appears a resurrected being sent from the very presence of God. He arrived in Joseph's room by coming through a conduit that opened up in heaven and allowed Moroni to descend right into that room. And all through the night, this glorious being who was full of light was speaking to Joseph. And when Joseph returns from the hill the following day and tells his siblings and his parents, any one of them could have and probably reasonably should have said, yeah, right. Joseph, I was in the room all night. I never saw a light. I never heard a voice. And yet, none of them ever questioned. None of them ever doubted the testimony that Joseph was then sharing with them. That's marvelous. That's a miracle. That's amazing, is what it is. Alvin being one of the siblings who did not doubt the testimony of his younger brother. It wouldn't be many days after that experience in which Alvin would get sick. And that sickness would turn for the worse and he would be deathly ill. Researchers and medical professionals assume that, um, based on symptoms and whatnot, that Alvin died of a ruptured appendix. However it was that he passed away, he did pass away. In fact, he passed away on November 19th, 1823. Now that date might not mean anything to you, but based on the story that I just shared with you of Joseph being called as a prophet and his experiences with the angel Moroni, that year should mean something. For it was September 21st, 1823, when Moroni first appeared at the bedside of Joseph. And Alvin would pass away on November 19th, 1823, just 59 days after that first appearance of Moroni. Why is all this significant? Because of what happens next. You see, from the time that Moroni appeared to Joseph the first time, to the day that Moroni dies, or, or excuse me, to the day that uh, Alvin dies is only 59 days. And in those 59 days, in fact, the very day that Alvin dies, where are the plates? 
they're still deposited in the side of the hill. Joseph had not brought them home. No one other than Joseph had seen them. Not a single character on the plates had been translated into the English language. So what does Alvin think of all this? We know exactly what he thinks of this because Mother Smith recorded Alvin's testimony of the Book of Mormon and his testimony of the prophetic calling of his kid, kid brother. Alvin's within hours of passing away. Being the oldest sibling, he feels somewhat of a responsibility to address his siblings and to give them final instructions and a charge for them to live up to. One by one, the children would come in and say goodbye to Alvin. Alvin would speak some words of counsel to each individual child, sibling. Finally, it was Joseph's turn. He comes to the bedside of his hero. He was everything that anyone could ever hope for in an older brother. Not only did Joseph have a great love for his older brother and a marvelous brotherly relationship, but in addition to that, Alvin was the great protector of the boy prophet. So not only is Joseph's heart breaking and he's overcome with grief and sorrow, but I can't help but conclude that Joseph must be a little panicked as well. How will I do this work without Alvin's help? We know the rest of the story, but on November 19th, Joseph didn't. Who would come to be by Joseph's side through thick and thin, through all the trials and tribulation, and even the moments leading to his own death? Who would be that in those individuals that would come to his side? In the coming years, it would be that void left by Alvin would be filled by Emma Smith and by Hiram Smith. Joseph goes in under these sorts of emotional, physical, spiritual, mental conditions. This burden that he's, he has in losing his brother. And he goes in to see Alvin, and this is where Alvin testifies of Joseph's prophetic calling and of the Book of Mormon. He says these words to his brother Joseph, Alvin speaking, I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instruction and in keeping every commandment that is given you. Two sentences, let me break it apart, let's have two thoughts here. I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Did Alvin Smith believe there was a record in the hill? Yes. The second part, be faithful in receiving instruction and in, in keeping every commandment that's given you. Who does Joseph claim is giving him commandments and instructions? God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and Moroni. Does Hiram believe, based on that single sentence, that the first vision took place? Yes. Does he believe that an angel sent from the very presence of God came and stood at the bedside of Joseph and instructed him to go to the hill to take a look at a record that one day will be translated? Yes, he believed that also. Only 59 days had elapsed since the Moroni visit, but Alvin died with the testimony on his lips that the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And with that, Alvin passed away. Now the Smith family and others came to this spot in Palmyra and surrounding an open grave, they endured listening to a preacher give the funeral sermon. And in that funeral sermon, in which I think was a warning shot to Joseph Smith, the preacher would say things such as, Alvin is in hell because he wasn't baptized. And while he is in hell, he will be tortured 
for all of eternity by the devils. He is burning in hell. There is no hope for Alvin. All is lost for Alvin. You Smith family members will never see Alvin again. Quite the funeral sermon, but this is how it went. And how did the Smith family respond? How did they react? The mother of Alvin, Lucy, said this in response to that funeral sermon. We all with one accord wept over our irretrievable loss, and we could not be comforted because he was not, he meaning Alvin. And again, let me break this quote apart. We all with one accord wept over our irretrievable loss. What did she and the other family members believe? That they would never see Alvin again. That it was till death do us part and death had happened and we're, our relationship is terminated. The second half, and we could not be comforted because he was not. She was in pain and anguish. And the reason she was in pain and anguish, she says, is because he is now in pain and anguish, being tortured for all of eternity, as was taught by this minister. What else could the Smith family believe? The beautiful doctrines of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ had not yet been restored. Those would come later in pieces and in parts throughout the next 20 or so years. Now today, as members of the church, we, we teach our little tiny children that go to nursery the plan of salvation, and that families can be f together forever. We sing the song, and we trust and we rely and we hope on those promises. We have faith that those things are true. It, my wife and I, we've never buried a child, fortunately. We can't fathom the pain and suffering that that would cause, even while knowing that that child was born in the covenant, even while knowing of the plan of salvation and the hope for re redemption through the atonement of Jesus Christ, even with the testimony and knowledge that we have, that pain, I think, would be, even, even with that, would be too great to bear. Maybe that's uh, why we've been fortunate to not have that trial in our life. And so Lucy, who does not have that information, who does not have that testimony because that doctrine is unknown to her, it, it just makes her pain and suffering and grief just, just indescribable. Can't even put into words or pretend to comprehend what she must have been going through. And when we look at the dates of when this happened, 1823, and the date of when section 137 was received, we find that 13 years would elapse before the doctrines contained in section 137 would be re revealed and received, accepted by the Smith family. So let's go to section 137. Now section 137 was received in Joseph Smith's office which was in the third, which was on the third floor of the Kirtland Temple at the far west end of the temple. And he, and on this day, he was in his office along with Father Smith and his brother Hiram and probably a few others. And they were there in, in that room when this vision opened. And Joseph addresses or describes how, how it all happened. The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter. Also the blazing throne of God whereon was seated the Father and the Son. Joseph Smith was permitted to enter the celestial kingdom, to see the celestial kingdom. For this, during this vision, he was there. He saw God the Father. He saw Jesus Christ. And he describes other things that he saw. Then he starts to talk about who he saw, beginning in verse 5. I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father and my mother and my brother Alvin that had long since slept. 
and marveled how it was that he had obtained an inheritance in that kingdom. He sees a bunch of people and then he notices Alvin and he uses the word, I marveled. Wait a minute. What's Alvin doing here? Because he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. So he's marveling. Hold on a second. Seeing Adam, Abraham, my father, mother, I'm good with that. But this one I didn't expect. What's Alvin doing here? And then the Lord starts to teach doctrine. And now you know from the historical stories that Alvin, as the Lord describes, are the prerequisites of getting into the celestial kingdom had you not been baptized during mortality. Verses 7 through 10 teaches that doctrine. Now you know that Alvin had a testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though he died about three and a half years after the first vision, even though he died 59 days after Moroni's first visit, which would make it nearly four years before Joseph would extract the Book of Mormon, so nearly five years before the Book of Mormon would be translated, despite dying seven years, almost seven years, before the formal organization of the church, which means that six years he, later after his death would come the priesthoods and the ordinance of baptism. He was before all, anything and all of it. And yet he found himself in the celestial kingdom of God. Verse 8, also all those who shall die uh, henceforth without, a, oh, excuse me, uh, verse 7, thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, all who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it had they been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. So before all those restoration events took place, Alvin had a testimony of its truthfulness. And so thereby, he was permitted to be an heir of the celestial kingdom. Now, what's the process between 1823 and the time when Alvin would, when he died, to the time that Alvin would find himself in the celestial kingdom? What was happening to Alvin to allow that progression to take place even beyond the grave? That's what we learn in section 138. Now, like I do with all of these sections and revelations, I'd like to tell the historical context of what's going on. However, Joseph F. Smith does a perfect job. He gives the historical context. Verses 1 through 11, he outlines what was going on that led to this vision. So I, I, it, rather than recapping the historical context here, let me just give you a couple of tidbits of who Joseph F. Smith is. He's the sixth president of the church. He was prophet, seer, and revelator, president of the church at the time that this revelation was given or this vision was seen by him. He is the son of Hiram Smith, which makes him the nephew of the prophet Joseph. Joseph F. Smith's son is Joseph Fielding Smith, who would be a church historian, who would be an apostle, and an eventual president of the church as well. So that's the genealogy there. He was on a mission. He was called on a full-time mission at the age of 15. He went to Hawaii. Now, a lot of people were heading to Hawaii in those days on their mission. They call, at the time, it was called the Sandwich Islands, including George Q. Cannon and, and others. And most people, nearly almost everyone, would be there in the Sandwich Islands for a few months get so frustrated with the language, not being able to communicate, that they'd get on a boat and come home. At age 15, Joseph F. Smith did not do that. He stayed. He learned the language, and he baptized a lot of people after sharing the gospel with them in their native tongue. But while he was there in the Sandwich Islands, now you understand he, the mission was difficult. It was hard. And imagine doing it at such a young age as well. He was having a bit of trial, trouble. And the work was hard. Being there so far away from home was difficult. And one night, Joseph F. Smith had a dream. 
And in that dream, he was walking. This has nothing to do with section 138. It's just a story I thought you might enjoy about Joseph F. Smith. In that dream, he's walking along a dusty road. And he's carrying some sort of a knapsack, a little bag is what he called a knapsack. And he's walking down this dusty road and it's, it's a hot day, so he's sweaty. Now he's covered in dust. And he comes across a sign that simply says the word bath with an arrow. And he says that he felt this desire to go and clean up. So he goes and jumps in a bathtub, gets all clean, and then he says, just as he's preparing to get out of the bath, he feels impressed to open up that bag that he's been carrying around. He opens up the bag and he finds a brand new set of temple garments. He puts them on and he describes how good it felt to not only be clean, but to feel clean. Well, he goes back out onto the road and he walks a little bit and he sees this huge mansion down further down the road. And he approaches the mansion and it's getting closer and he's feeling this anticipation that I, I need to go to that mansion. He eventually gets to the mansion. He goes up the stairs. He knocks on the door. And who answers but his uncle, Joseph Smith the prophet. The door opens up and Joseph Smith is there. Behind Joseph, he sees his father, Hiram. He also sees John Taylor and Brigham Young and other men that he, he knows, he rec that he recognized. All of them who had previously passed away. Well, maybe not all, well. And he sees, he sees this scene. And when the door opens, he sees the scene and Joseph Smith the prophet, he scolds his nephew. He says, Joseph, you're late. And Joseph F. Smith's response was, yes, but I am clean. And with that, he woke up. That was the end of the vision. And you can interpret that as, as you'd like to. So he goes through this uh, um, vision, and the doctrines contained that you'll be able to read here. I want to just point out a couple. Of course, the question that he has that he describes in those first 11 verses is, what did the Lord do between the time of crucifixion and resurrection? While his body was in the tomb, what went on? What was he doing? And in verse 30, we start to get the idea, or we get the clear idea. He, he talks up to verse 30, so verse 12 through 29, he talks about how he goes to the righteous. He preaches to them. The righteous are so anxious to hear that redemption is made possible because the atonement has been completed or will yet be completed as soon as the Savior returns to his body. But the Savior comes to the spirit world, declares the infinite, perfect atonement's taken place, and they rejoice. And then he makes note that, and it's almost a curiosity thing, that the Savior doesn't go to the unrighteous. He doesn't go to the spirit prison. But rather he stays with the righteous and he organizes them. And he organizes them into a missionary force. And that missionary force will then go to the spirit prison and preach to those who did not know about the gospel while living in mortality. And now we come to verse 30. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. I would invite you to cross-reference, not by going to the footnotes at the bottom of the page, but do it on your own, go cross-reference that with section 109. Section 109 is the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple. But in that prayer, the Lord teaches that when people go to the temple, they'll come out of the temple armed with power. And with that power, they are then commissioned to share the gospel with all the inhabitants of the world. So the very thing that the Lord sets up in the next life, He has set up in this life for members of His church to be armed with power to share the gospel. What we do on this side of the veil is the exact same thing that's going on on the other side of the veil. And that's why, and that, it, that could be one of the reasons why President Nelson 
has given us, the living, the charge and responsibility to gather Israel on this side of the veil and the other. Now, we've interpreted that rightfully so as we share the gospel on this, in, in, in this life with others who don't know of it, and we do temple work to help the work on the other side of the veil. Yeah, that's true. That's right. But in that is also the, the truth, scripturally proven, that it's the truth that what is organized and done as described in verse 30 of section 138 is the exact same thing that has been organized on this side of the veil. And we, by choice, can participate in this gathering while in mortality. So don't wait to do your missionary work until you're dead. And then we go to verse 32. Thus was the gospel preached to those who had died in their sins without a knowledge of the truth or in, or in transgression, having rejected the prophets. So that's how it happened. Alvin was over there. He was part of the group that didn't know the fullness of the gospel. I like to think that he was quite advanced among that group of people because he had a testimony that it was true. He just needed to hear the whole story so that he could then be invited after his acceptance and obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel into the celestial kingdom. Let's continue on in verse 39, and then I'm going to jump back. I'm going to flip-flop a little bit here, but in verse 39, he sees a lot of people. He starts talking about, I saw Adam, and I saw Abel, and Noah, and Seth, and he continues to list off all these great patriarchs that lived and died serving the Lord. But I love in verse 39, of all the people he sees, he gives detail of a select smaller group. Verse 39. And he gives the detail. It doesn't just rattle off who he's saying, but he says, and I also saw our glorious mother Eve with many of her faithful daughters who had lived through the ages and worshiped the true and living God. And then he gets back to his list of men. And it's just a list. He doesn't take the time or focus as he does in verse 39 with Mother Eve and faithful women. My interpretation is that it's the women, the righteous daughters, who are really propelling this work forward in gathering Israel on this side of the veil and the other, as President Nelson puts it. And he takes that moment to describe those, the, those women and, and who they are, the many faithful daughters who had lived through all the ages and worshiped the true and living God. Worship is not sitting complacently in sacrament meeting and listening to the speaker. Worship is action. He talks about how it's the daughters, the women, who take action and is moving this work forward. I like that. We go backwards now to verse 33 and 34. In verse 33, so he talks about the organization of 33-32. And now that we've got the troops organized, the missionary force ready to go, what are these missionaries going to teach those people? Who haven't heard the gospel. This is what they teach. These were taught, meaning that those who didn't know the gospel, these were taught faith in God, repentance from sin, vicarious baptism for the remission of sins, gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Four points of doctrine. That sounds a whole lot like article of faith number four. We believe that the first four principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is that not what they say here in verse 33? That's what's being taught. So what we teach our primary age children, and what we teach our investigators as missionaries, and what we start to share with our neighbors and friends and relatives and co-workers as the foundational basis of our church and what we believe it's those four points. Those are the, as the article of faith says, those are the first four principles of the gospel. 
In addition, in verse 34, it continues on, and all other principles of the gospel as well. But those first four, and then we expand and we talk about everything. Now, go back in verse 33 and take a look and compare that side by side with article of faith number four. There's one difference, one small difference, a single word, vicarious. So the spirits on the other side who are learning about the gospel, they learn faith, repentance, vicarious baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Whereas on this side of the veil, we teach, if you have faith, repent of your sins, then we'd like to invite you over to the stake center on Sunday afternoon for a baptism. We'll baptize you for the remission of sins, confirm you a member of the church, and then we'll help you on the covenant path to the temple and just enjoy all the blessings of the gospel. That's how it works on earth. In the spirit world, they're taught, you've got faith? Great. You've repented of your sins? Wonderful. Uh, yeah, baptism's not going to work over here because we don't have bodies, so it's got to be vicarious baptism. Let me step back to point two, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance isn't just a confession and forsaking of sin. It's also an acceptance of the atonement of Jesus Christ. So I believe when, when it's the word repentance is used in the verses and the article of faith as I've quoted, it's not limiting itself to sin, but it's a key word that reflects an individual who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Redeemer. How do we accept? Just vocally say, I accept? We know that that's not true. There's more to it. And we're repeatedly told what it means to accept Jesus as our Savior every Sunday in the sacramental prayers. Take upon us His name. Keep His commandments. And, um, and we'll have His Spirit to be with us always if we, if we do those things. It will be, if, if we uh, take upon us His name and we're obedient, uh, obedient to His commandment and always remember Him. If we do those three things, we have His Spirit to be with us. And those, doing those three things, is that not accepting through action the atonement of Jesus Christ and accepting Him as our personal Savior and Redeemer? I think so. And so as we look at this, let's go back to our four points of what our kindred dead have to learn before they can go to the celestial kingdom. Faith, repentance, vicarious baptism. So let's step aside from the written doctrine, the scriptures, and let's just go with Tom Pettit's opinion here for a second. I see in my mind an amazing, miraculous, merciful event taking place where God has created a situation where every one of his sons and daughters can be redeemed and come to the celestial kingdom. Even those who die without a knowledge of the gospel, even those who die with a testimony but didn't have the opportunity, such as Alvin, even those who died in their infancy, have an opportunity at full redemption and access to the celestial kingdom if they will just exercise faith and repentance and obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, everybody can come in. That's about as amazing as it gets. And yet in that same scene, it's equally as devastating. Remember, this is Tom Pettit's opinion. It's equally as devastating because that missionary who goes and finds that person says, okay, you've exercised faith, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Redeemer, you're willing to be obedient to Him, uh, because you've repented. And now, because you want all that, we can't go any further. Because it's vicarious baptism that we teach over here in the spirit world. And we can't baptize you for real or vicariously here. And so the individual says, well, what do you mean? I, yeah, I have faith. I've repented. And I have a desire to come be where you are. Teach me how to be a missionary. I want to tell all my friends and family here in the spirit world as well. And, and eventually I want to go to the celestial kingdom and be with my Savior. I want to be with my Heavenly Father. And, and I want to be there with my family, with my wife and my children. I want all those blessings. I want those gospels. Don't tell me I can't do that. And the missionary says, you can't. I, despite your faith, despite your obedience, despite your, your efforts, 
despite your desires, you can't come be where the Savior is. You can't come and be where heavenly. No, an eternal family is not yet available for you. And so I've done all, the missionary speaking, I've done all that I can do for you. I need to go teach somebody else now. And that person sits down and they think, you got to be kidding me. And they sit and wait and wait and wait. Knowing that they can only go where they want to be if somebody on earth will find their name and then somebody on earth will take their name to the temple. It's the only way that they can progress. We go to verse 58. The dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to, to, through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God. They can't be redeemed until their work is done. President McKay, when asked, is all this work that we're doing worth it? How many of them, you know, how do we know if they're really accepting the work that we're doing for them? He says, almost all, if not all, who had their temple work done for them will accept the temple work done for them. Verse 128, all is not lost. It gets hopeful. Section 128, verse 15, Joseph Smith writing a letter. He says, and now, my dearly beloved brethren and sisters, let me assure you that these are principles in relation to the dead and the living that cannot be lightly passed over as pertaining to our salvation. For their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation. As Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect. Okay, so we've been through it. We understand that they must wait until somebody performs vicariously the ordinances of the temple. 58 says the ordinances of the house of God. We understand that. So they cannot be made perfect without us. But what about the second half of that quote? First by the prophet Joseph, and then he's quoting how Paul says the same thing. As pertaining to our salvation, for their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation as well. And Paul said the same. They cannot be made perfect without us, of course. We've talked about that. But neither can we without our dead be made perfect. I would take you now to a quote from President Nelson in which he gave this quote in the October 2021 General Conference. He said on Sunday morning, the temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude because the Savior and His doctrine are the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple through instruction and through the Spirit increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. His essential ordinances bind us to Him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then, as we keep our covenants, He endows us with His healing, strengthening power. And oh, how we will need His power in the days ahead. So how do we secure our own salvation? By attending the temple. To simply going and checking off a box saying, I went to the temple, I'm earning my oil in my lamp. That's not at all what it means. What he means and what I testify of as well is that when we go to the temple to do the redemptive work for our dead, that by participating in those ordinances, we change and become a better person, a more Christ-like person, a more Christ-centered person, with all of the focus being on our Savior. And by becoming that type of person that the temple transforms us into, we will find ourselves in the celestial kingdom. And so I'll highlight again some of the things from President Nelson's quote. The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith. So how do we strengthen our faith? By helping to redeem our dead. So our dead get redeemed by the acts of us, but because we are redeeming them, through that process, we're getting redeemed as well because one of the essential steps is faith. And our faith is strengthened by doing that work. Our spiritual fortitude is strengthened. 
everything taught in the temple through instruction or through the Spirit. So we go there to hear Him, to receive personal revelation. It all increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. Then as we keep those covenants, so as we return to the temple time and time again, we hear those covenants. We remember those covenants. We start to better understand those covenants. President Nelson says, as we keep our covenants, He then endows us with His healing, strengthening power. And then President Nelson prophesies, we will need His power in the days ahead. I'll take you back to the vision, section 150, 138, verse 52. Just the second half. And be partakers. So he talks about this, the, the end result. We're, we're, we're going to do it. We can do it. And it's going to happen for them and for us. And then we will all be partakers of all blessings which were held in reserve for them that love Him. So all can be partakers. You, me, and them can all be partakers of all the blessings that have been held in reserve by the Lord, now made available to those who love Him. That word, love, makes me think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the good news of the gospel, that a loving Heavenly Father has made a plan of happiness, a plan of salvation available to all of His children, made possible only through the Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, And I say that in His name, Jesus Christ. Amen.